Hello everyone, my name is Jared Frederick. I'm an instructor of history at Penn State Altoona, and I'm the author of Dispatches of D-Day, a people's history of the Normandy invasion. What I strive to do in this book was to resurrect many of the lost voices of the Normandy invasion, which took place 77 years ago. And it's my hope for you as educators that we will be able to get a conversation going later on about really fitting ways to incorporate primary sources in the classroom. Uh, but at the heart of this epic tale is a story of common people that are the same ages or people who are only a little bit older than many of the students who you teach in the classroom. Our story today begins Oddly enough, not on the beaches of Normandy, but in the rain-drenched streets of Austin, Texas. Students were studying for final exams at the University of Texas. There were rainstorms uh, coming in and, and hitting town. And over the, the crackle of the airwaves came the long-anticipated news that the Normandy invasion had at last begun. And a student writer with the university newspaper by the name of Horace Busby, who we see here, wrote a very eloquent summation of how those students reacted. And he said, roommates were rolled out of bed, lights snapped on as fast as word could be screamed down hallways, telephones began to ring, and a rain-drenched Austin came to life. And invariably, this was the reaction that was occurring in most American towns on that Tuesday morning, a morning that would define history for days, months, and years to come. And of course, additional news would be arriving on people's front porches and front sidewalks just a few hours later. These large, dramatic, bold, sometimes even red headlines would be splashed across America's newspapers. The methodology for my book consisted of reviewing 150 different American newspapers. I transcribed 300,000 words in newspaper reports. And out of that, I pulled some of the best pieces and snippets, ones that I thought best conveyed what the D-Day experience was all about. And for all of the educators watching, I strongly encourage you, if you have the resources at your disposal, to use items like newspaperarchive.com, newspaper.com, and ancestry.com. These are wonderful ways to get your students in touch with the past. And you can always, uh, often do it with a bit of local flavor. Um, as well. And so this kind of organic grassroots way of looking at history, contextualizing history, is a very thorough means of getting students to make a profound connection to it. Um, and certainly that was the case for me as I was researching this. One of my favorite newspapers to look at was the military newspaper still in publication today that was known as Stars and Strikes. And prior to the invasion, uh, Stars and Stripes put forth a, a, a plea, a maxim of sorts, to its military readers. And it stated, the quest to self-educate will in itself make you a better informed soldier, a better educated American. And in the days ahead, when it becomes your job to help decide issues on which the future all depends, your knowledge of the big picture will make you a better citizen, and in a small way, that will help make this a better world. And so this newspaper was framing the forthcoming invasion in moral terms, and it was really underscoring the importance of literacy, the significance of the access to free information, and also a, a celebration of the free press as well. Uh, a free press and an unfree press was the difference between democracy and tyranny. And this was one of the things that many American service members were in fact fighting for. Unfortunately though, these aspirations did not always play out in reality. And the best example of this is the fact 
that America's military was still segregated, and it would, re would remain so for another four years. Over a million African Americans served in uniform during the Second World War, and for those who found themselves in England in the months before the Normandy invasion, they had to fight two different wars, as one black sergeant very aptly stated here. We black troops went overseas to fight the Germans, but we had to fight the Yanks first. There was no Jim Crow, there was no Keller line in England, and uh, sadly enough, uh, many of these American troops felt more at home in a foreign land and were treated better in this foreign land than what they were in their own country. These conversations about civil rights, however, begin to emerge in America's newspapers, and perhaps most prominently among them was the Pittsburgh Courier, the most widely read African-American newspaper in the United States at that time, and the Pittsburgh Courier initiated what became known as the Double V Campaign. Victory overseas would eventually mean victory at home. Hard-won rights in the name of civil rights. And if the history of the 1950s and the 1960s would indicate anything to us, it's that these black soldiers set forth a foundation for very dramatic social movements that would be on the near horizon. And this was an element of my research that I was not initially expecting when I embarked on this endeavor. Um, we can see uh, somewhat similar levels of inequity in regard to uh, American women uh, who were involved in this militarized world. And uh, this certainly included female correspondents. Uh, most notable among them, a writer for Collier's Weekly who was known as Martha Gellhorn. And uh, she very fiercely said to one of her editors that it is necessary that I report on this war. I must see for those who cannot see for themselves. That's very good logic when you think about it. Um, and so she had kind of two strikes going against her. She was working in a male-dominated world, both the military and the press. And oddly enough, um, one of her greatest roadblocks, if you will, was her own husband, the man who we see in the upper right-hand corner. That is Ernest Hemingway, who also worked for Collier's Weekly and saw his wife not only as a spouse but as a competitor. And so we're going to see how these two individuals experienced the Normandy invasion a little bit later on. But as to, you know, the big question of when the invasion would start, you know, that, that was the question on everybody's mind. Uh, but in the perspective of United States Army Air Forces and one of its head chiefs, General Henry Hap Arnold, he made the argument that the invasion was already underway. It had been underway for over two years by that point. And he said, in a, a somewhat fiery address to the, the press, he said, we are invading and not at some remote beachhead. We are hitting the enemy where he lives. He knows if he cannot stop us, he's left. And so with these thoughts in mind, there, there's very much a quantity over quality attitude in the way that the Americans are fighting the war. The, the idea that we are simply going to outproduce the enemy and we can replace equipment and material and men much quicker than he can. And uh, the perfect case in point here is this uh, June 1st, 1944 photo at Devon, England. And here we see these, these mass arrays of, of troops and supplies being mobilized in the port, getting ready to board landing ship tanks that we see here in the background. And one reporter referred to this, this huge task as a mechanical Niagara. Um, you know, picture Niagara Falls, but instead of water, it's just an endless heap of equipment and boxes and crates and vehicles and ships and tanks and everything imaginable. The weight of this moment was placed on the shoulders of one person in particular a man who had never seen combat before, never personally led men into battle, never shot, you know, a, a gun in anger in his life. And of course, I speak of Dwight David Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force. And ultimately, it was up to him 
went to send these hundreds of thousands of men in what he would call the Great Crusade. And I think Anne O'Hare McCormick of the New York Times said it best when she noted that never has the fate of so many depended on the judgment of so few. Perhaps having these thoughts in mind, the day prior to the invasion, Dwight Eisenhower pens this, this simple note. And what it is is that it is an admission of guilt for the failure of Operation Overlord. And in my mind, this is an ultimate sign of his leadership because good leaders not only take responsibility for success, but they also acknowledge their potential pitfalls. And it demonstrates to us that Dwight Eisenhower was taking every sort of angle into consideration, even that of failure. Uh, but what is so notable about this letter is that it's dated July 5th, not June 5th. Um, and so I think that puts us in his state of mind at the moment. You know, when you get the month wrong, when you're, you're penning a letter, um, I think that's something quite revealing indeed. But ultimately, after a 24-hour delay due to poor weather, the invasion is set for June 6th. And this is the theater of war in which all of this drama will unfold. There were primarily five Allied beachheads spanning a stretch of 50 miles along the Normandy coast, two American sectors, two British sectors, and a Canadian sector. And it will be along these shores that about 160,000 Allied troops will be hitting the beaches and be landing behind enemy lines on what Erwin Rommel called the longest day. The first of these Allied warriors were paratroopers and men who landed in glider planes. About 13,000 of them would land in about 700 different aircraft in the earliest hours and minutes of June 6, 1944. And certainly this painting that we see here in the background conveys the drama, the shock, uh, the fear of landing in the combat zone at that moment. I don't know if any of you watching have ever gone skydiving, um, but it can be a rather frightful experience. And doing so at night, while there's people shooting at you, while you're bogged down with 100 pounds of equipment, and there's a strong possibility that you might land in a flooded swamp and drown, uh, these were the, the very real circumstances and dire circumstances in which these men fought. In any case, um, a lot of them had a lot of bravado. And it was, this uh, was perhaps uh, no better articulated than with the men of the so-called Filthy 13, a platoon of men in the 101st Airborne Division who had not taken showers since December because they wanted to live it rough. They, uh, you know, had Mohawk-style hairs. They put on war paint. They carried brass knuckles and bowie knives. And I think Stars and Stripes said it best uh, of these men, pity the poor Nazi who encounters them. Um, and so I think this is the perfect representation of that sort of gusto and uh, esprit de corps that uh, many of these paratroopers had. Meanwhile, a few miles offshore, there are some 5,000 Allied ships circling around getting ready for a big morning bombardment and loading amphibious troops into their landing craft. And the photograph that we see here, I think, uh, perhaps best conveys the scale of this naval operation that was codenamed Neptune. And Captain Herschel West said of this vista, one could use all the adjectives such as colossal, magnificent, stupendous, marvelous, greatest, immense, and still not give any idea of the number of men and material being moved. So certainly, uh, those that saw it, you know, they thought that it was almost something biblical in nature. And of course, I found many stories about many uh, sailors and, and members of the United States Navy and the British Navy, and uh, among the most interesting of them 
was a sailor by the name of Lawrence Patman. And Patman was an operator of a landing craft. He was taking these amphibious troops ashore, and he noticed that the soldiers that he was transporting had a, a pet dog, a, a, a dog that they had you know, scrounged from the, the streets of London and whatnot. And the dog's name was Muffin. And uh, somehow these soldiers had smuggled the, the dog aboard, and uh, Patman got a good bit of amusement out of all of this. But moments later, the landing craft took a direct hit. The men flew sky high from the boat. They landed in the water, Patman among them. Uh, but at first, Patman could not see any of his fellow survivors. And when he tried to swim, he noticed that his hand had swollen to the size of a football. And he thought, this is it. I'm going to die here in the English Channel. No one's going to know what happened to me. Um, but ultimately, his salvation arrived with the sound of a bark. Uh, Muffin survived the blast, and Patman called out to the dog, here, boy, here. And Patman was amazed when the dog actually swam over. And uh, Patman used the dog as an improvised flotation device until another boat ultimately picked them up. Uh, Patman survived his wounds without his hand, though, unfortunately. And uh, he, he later said, you know, that dog saved my life. Um, but even so, you know, Patman thought that his story wasn't anything, you know, but dramatic. Um, and when he got back home, he said, what the hell can I tell my grandchildren? And so I think it speaks to some of the humility of this generation, but certainly I, this was one of the more powerful and dramatic stories that I came across. And indeed, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Um, among the first Americans ashore, my grandfather among them, were men of the 4th Infantry Division who landed on Utah Beach. And these were among the, the quickest and most successful of the D-Day operations as the men met light defenses here and started rather quickly moving inland. Uh, but for the men of the 4th, also known as the Ivy Division, they thought that they weren't getting their due credit in the press regarding their exploits. And uh, Stars and Stripes later reported on this, saying the boys of the Ivy Division heard that a lot of people were getting credit for the Allied advances in France. That is, almost everybody but the fourth. And this underscores the importance of newspapers to American troops, because they had this firm belief that if they were doing a good job and acting heroically, they wanted other people to be reading about it. And so this once more speaks to the sanctity of the free press in wartime. One reporter who experienced this firsthand is the gentleman who we see here on the right, who was known as Don Whitehead, who worked for the Associated Press. And he and a Hungarian-born photographer named Robert Kappa were among the few journalists to step ashore Omaha Beach that very deadly morning. And... Don Whitehead simply said that this place was hotter than hell, that no matter where a shell landed, it was going to hit somebody. The beach became congested. You had these waterlogged troops wading their way up through the surf, and it was sheer butchery. Uh, Robert Kappa, in the midst of all of this, uh, took this very iconic photograph in the background that, in my mind, uh, just speaks to the chaos and carnage of the moment. One young man who saw this up close and personal was a soldier in the 29th Infantry Division whose name was Harold Bungarten. And uh, we can see him here on the right as a young man. And he almost did not survive Omaha Beach. And uh, a, a subsequent newspaper account said this of his travails. Shell fragments creased his skull and S-mine shattered his knee and machine gun bullets smashed the small bones of his right foot. A shell also went off in his face, ripped away part of his jaw. His, uh, the, the flesh of his cheek was, was flapping in the breeze. 
But amazingly, Baumgarten survived this, went through a dozen different reconstructive surgeries, and then he himself became a doctor after the war because he wanted to help people as people had helped him. And we can see him here in later life, and uh, he, he really became a champion of his generation and kept telling those stories um, until his final years. So very compelling stuff here. For Martha Gellhorn, who was in a feud with her husband, um, she had stowed away on a British hospital ship, and uh, she actually became the first female correspondent to step foot on Normandy soil on that very day, and she beat her husband to the punch in that regard. But she was so overcome with emotion at this moment uh, you know, she had to put down her pen momentarily, and she said, it will be hard to tell you of the wounded. There were so many of them. There was no time to talk. There was too much else to do. And I think it speaks to how people were just really overcome with the emotion of the moment. And this is certainly true of perhaps the best-known war correspondent of all, Ernie Pyle. He arrived at... Normandy, the following day, he stepped on the beach on June 7th, and in seeing scenes like this that we see on our screen, he noted, on the beach lay expended sufficient men and mechanism for a small war. They were gone forever now, and yet we could afford it. And this was, you know, the harsh arithmetic of war in Ernie Pyle's mind. Um, a third element of my book examines the home front during the Normandy invasion, because I was always wondering, how were people back in the United States responding to news of this great and calamitous event? And all in all, I think the, the word of the hour was solidarity. Um, people came together, people, at least momentarily, in many instances, put aside their differences. And uh, this photograph of a synagogue in New York City, I just think, speaks volumes. And the sign above the doorway on this synagogue, which uh, still stands today, noted that this synagogue will be open for 24 hours for special services on D-Day. All are welcome. People were standing in Times Square for hours that day, just hanging on the, the latest bits of news fragments that were coming in. It was a very emotional moment for the American people. And it was the biggest news story ever in American history because almost everybody knew somebody who was participating in it. Unfortunately, uh, solidarity didn't prevail everywhere, including in Cincinnati, Ohio, where an ongoing labor strike was taking place the same week as D-Day. Uh, this became known as the D-Day strike. And uh, workers at an aeronautical plant in Cincinnati walked off the job because the factory had recently hired five African-American workers to work in the metal shop. And so this whole plant shut down because you had a, a bunch of white employees didn't want to work with black employees. And, you know, airplanes are not being made as a result. And uh, rightfully so, the Cincinnati Post called out these strikers saying, you right workers. What will you say to the fathers and mothers of those men who fall in France? And indeed, as we get into the latter weeks of June 1944, um, a lot of the units that had been fighting in Normandy had a terrible toll inflicted upon them. And this included the stalwart men of the 101st Airborne Division, who on June 20th, 1944, uh, gathered in the town square of Carentan for a medal ceremony. And right after the ceremony took place, over a thousand of these paratroopers uh, huddled into the, the local YMCA that was known as Le Jean d'Arc, and they watched a movie, a comedy. It was called Andy Hardy's Blonde Trouble. And, you know, just for these 90 minutes, you know, these, these hardened veterans, they were kids again. Uh, they, they got to laugh it off a little bit. And for some of them, it was the last movie they would ever see. And even more evocatively, the town had its theater back because this was the first movie in four years that wasn't a German film. And I think there's no better story uh, that captures the essence of what liberation was all about. 
All of this, of course, came at a very high cost. And it affects people to this very day. Among those who were lost off Normandy's shores were Henry and Louis Piper, 19-year-old twins who both served as radio operators on LST-523, a naval vessel that we see here. About two weeks after D-Day, 523 was struck by an underwater mine. Over 100 men on board were killed, and both of these brothers were among them. And you can't even begin to imagine the pain that their parents had to go through. It's tragic enough when you lose one son in a war, but to lose two sons in a war that were both born on the same day and they end up dying on the same day, I can't even begin to fathom. Only three years ago, the Piper brothers were reunited in death. One of their remains had been missing, and thanks to the research of a high school student, believe it or not, uh, this great mystery was solved, the brothers were reunited, and in this photograph we see on the left, their nieces and nephews, who they never met, laid them to rest together in the Normandy American Cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach. There are over 9,000 American troops buried in this cemetery. Um, that accounts for a, a pittance of the overall number of Americans who were killed in this war, and even a smaller fraction of the total 65 million people who lost their lives as a result of the Second World War. But all of these years later, we must continue to ask the question, what do we owe the dead? What can we learn from these people who never had a chance to grow old? And I think Dwight Eisenhower himself, in two different instances, uh, gave us very fitting answers to those important questions. At a press briefing shortly after the invasion, Eisenhower said, Our countries fight best when our people are best informed. I should feel disturbed if I thought that I or my public relations staff were held as anything but friends of the press. I will never tell you anything false. In Eisenhower's mind, the best way to pay tribute to these men and women was to be honest, to be truthful wherever possible, to be informed, to be an engaged citizen. That is how you honor what the World War II generation did. That is also how you help preserve the notions of democracy. And 20 years later, as Eisenhower revisited Normandy with CBS News journalist Walter Cronkite, who was himself a war correspondent in Normandy, they toured the American cemetery there together. And out looking over these 9,400 tombstones, Dwight Eisenhower, in the final years of his life, says this, I devoutly hope that we will never again have to see such scenes as these. I think and hope and pray that humanity will learn more than we had learned up to that time. But these people gave us a chance. They bought time for us so that we can do better than we have before. And that in many ways is the great task remaining to us this three quarters of a century later. What are we going to do with the chance that that generation gave to us 75 years ago? That's what we always have to keep in mind. You can learn more about the stories that we just discussed and many more in my book, Dispatches of D-Day. And I also have a, a newer book out on shelves uh, that also makes ample use of primary sources uh, where it investigates the wartime letters of Major Dick Winters of Band of Brothers fame. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and I look forward to getting in some discussion with you and answering your questions. Thank you for tuning in.